You know, Jim, if, if the members of the G family are here, generation, generation, down, down, uh, would they stand up? Please stand up. The Gs are, okay. Very good, thank you. Um, landmarks and landmark people. Um, speaking of landmarks. <laughs> I think I'm the kid at the table. I'm not sure. You're, am I older than you? I'm going to hit 80 pretty soon. Well, I'm older than you. You're the kid. <laughs> well, let me just say that uh, with my brother's great-grandchildren, we've been in this area for seven generations now because our great-grandparents came here in 1899 and built a home on Hancock in Montague Township. And uh, my grandfather married my grandmother, who was a daughter to uh, Henry and Margaret Sieben, and built a house, a log house, on that same piece of property. How many of you know the what I still call the uh, Harry Block? log house on Hancock. There's a log house on Hancock. Well, right across the street was the original Seaman farm, my grandmother's father's farm. And they had, Grandma and Grandpa built a log house just like Block's house. But it caught fire in 1910 and burned to the ground, taking the barn and the chicken house and everything with it. So Grandpa decided there wasn't any place to make enough money to build again here, so he moved to Chicago. Took his uh, kids, my father and his two sisters. Dad had gone to school at the school on Post and Hancock, where they sell um, asparagus. Now he's got a little, that house on the northeast corner was the school that my dad went to when they were on the farm. Anyway. Make a long story short, uh, Grandma and Grandpa came back <clears throat> uh, to the farm after Grandpa made enough money to get uh, going again. And uh, then my dad was in a severe accident in Chicago uh, and, and uh, couldn't work anymore and decided that we were going to move back to the farm. So we moved back to the farm in 1942. But it was like being at home because I had spent every Christmas, every Christmas, every summer that I can remember, um, and I have pictures showing me even before I can remember on the farm with uh, the great grandmothers at, and staying at their house. So I was in Michigan all summer in the, from my childhood until we moved back. And so it, was, it always seemed like that was more of a home than Chicago was. But you can imagine my dad married a girl who was from Chicago. And although mother had been up in the summertime with great grandma and grandpa, she knew what the rigors of country living were. But if you can imagine that when my dad could no longer operate, uh, he had a severe skull fracture and uh, was incapacitated for several years. To move from Chicago, where she had running water, central heat, transportation, electricity, to a three-room home that my dad and I built, 24 by 24, with a coal stove in the one room, and there was a small bedroom for my one brother, uh, Don, who was, Wayne was born when we were here. and a larger bedroom for my folks, and then one big room, which was the living room, the dining room, the kitchen, and whatever else. But mother made it. She adjusted the, we had a, we had a three-holer, and, and we had carpeting on it. <laughs> carpeting. And my grandmother's was even greater than that, because she had wallpaper in hers. I'll have to tell you, Maybe I should. Well, I will. <laughs> Grandpa used to drop a piece of newspaper in the hole before he sat down in the wintertime. Kind of warmed it up a little bit. So I thought I would do that. Well, if you don't get that paper down far enough when it flares up, 
not only warms you, but it gets you off the hole, I can tell you. Well, <laughs> but we didn't get electricity. Uh, in fact, we didn't get electricity until uh, 1952. And we, my folks uh, bought the Rose Farm, which is on the corner of Hancock and Lehman. Um, not Lehman, uh, Lamus. And uh, that's where they moved to while I was in the service overseas. And uh, the REA came and they said, we're putting lines in, but it'll cost you $100 for the pole to get it to your farm. And my dad says, no, I ain't paying $100. Well, my mother and dad got into quite a discussion about that. But dad held fast until the farm next to us, or down on south of us, um, Napier, Mr. Harry Napier came up and he said to my dad, he says, Hank, we decided we want electricity, but I understand you won't pay for the pole on yours. And he says, uh, well, it was $100, my dad said, I ain't paying $100. He says, we're getting along all right. Well, Harry says, I'll tell you what, he says, if, would you have him put the pole in for $50? My dad says, well, yeah, I, I expect maybe we do that, but they aren't going to cut down on it. And Harry says, that's all right. He says, I'll give you the other 50, because my wife says, we're going to have it. <laughs> and so they, they did, and then they got the electricity. But my mother told my dad, why didn't you hold out? He'd have probably given you the other 50, <laughs> and you wouldn't have to pay anything. Well, so after that, she was much happier with everything. Um, I can tell you all kinds of stories about G's, but let me, let me just reminisce a little bit about what I can remember about G's. One other thing about Carl, he was a great guy, and he could add up the stuff as it was being laid out on the table in his head faster than either I or ever could add it up on the adding machine. As it was laid out on there, he just came up with it. It, was just, it just amazed me how quick he was in, in doing that sort of thing great guy to work for. Uh, and as you all know, I ended up with a licensed funeral director primarily because of Carl, because he helped me with my schooling, paying for my schooling. The only thing I argued about him was when I was making 32 cents an hour, he uh, pulled me aside and said, now, he says, you're not going to get your full check. I'm not going to get my full check. It's only a couple of dollars or so. He said, no, he says, I'm holding out 10% and I'm investing it for you. Well, you know, when you're, when you're 17 or 18 years old, you don't, well, 16 years old, really, and, and after that. And he said, no, nope, I'm putting that into Investors Diversified, and that's going to be yours and it'll grow rapidly and you'll be happy to do it. Well, I never was until... Um, when I came back from the service, I needed some money, and by golly, there it was, and it was all because of Carl, and he, he didn't talk to me about it, he just told me he was going to do it, you know. <laughs> well, you've heard where all the places were. Uh, one of them that uh, I used to work at the A&P, remember where the A&P store was? Bud Kunis was the manager at that time, and Mary Morningstar was the cashier. And I was the stock boy and, and uh, the um, vegetable, uh, what it, green goods, uh, taken care of. Yeah, produce, and we had a little misty thing that was over the counter, and you had to make sure that was clean so the mist was nice and kept the vegetables all nice. But Bud, Bud Kunis and Mary were, what do I want to say? adversarial from the beginning when I worked there. And I, I probably shouldn't say this, but Mary could cuss more than any mule skinner. And Bud Kunis was her equal. And when they got in it on something, the ears of a young boy got very red because they didn't pull any punches, but they were very good when customers were in the store. So you know, nobody else knew it except when I was over at the counter and 
doing what I had to do, and I'd hear those two up in the front going at it. And I thought, oh, man, oh, man, I've never heard anybody talk like that before. Well, but then I used to take my lunch at uh, Lil Ransom's. You remember Lil had a little restaurant there, and uh, I guess it's where uh, Pitkins got their store, new store now, right? That was the, wasn't that Lil's? Yeah. yeah. And uh, that was a great place to go. But of course, working at G's, the other place I went was Dowker's. And uh, most of you know that uh, we Montague boys kind of had a thing about Whitehall girls, you know, that was kind of a, not supposed to cross the bridge, you know, all that kind of stuff back then, anyway. Um, but I used to get one heaping big malted when I went in there from a certain gal behind the counter. And one day she threw the counter wiping rag at me, and it hit me, and I thought, doggone, somebody's got to tame that gal. And so I did, and I finally asked her to marry me. She said yes, and we, we've gone from there. In Montague, what I remember fondly is old uh, Fred Sweet's general store. Anybody remember Fred Sweet in the general store? There's somebody way in the back. Fred's general store was a general store. I mean, it had everything from clothing to uh, food to meat to uh, lamps to fuel oil. My brother Wayne was uh, about five, six years old, I think, and winter was coming. He didn't have any long underwear. So Friday nights was a big night in Montague. Friday night, the family went downtown. Mother went shopping over to Sweets. Dad went over to Happy Crawls for his beer. And us kids all went down to Olson's Barber Shop because the Chamber of Commerce had free movies on the side of the building. Okay. Great night. I mean, it was just great. Well, we went, Mother and, and Wayne and I were down there, and we went into sweets because we always had to get some candy to take over to the, see the show. And she asked uh, Sweet if he had any underwear left for little kid or small kids. Oh, yeah, he says, I, I'm sure I got some up there. He says, it's getting toward winter. So he got up on the ladder and the top shelf and pulled down a box, and by golly, there was a set of long, John's, wool. Ma says, I'll take them, they'll fit, that's the right size. Well, we got home and she says, now I want you to try these on. Well, Wayne pulled them on and they had feet in them. <laughs> he said, I ain't wearing these to school, I'm not wearing anything with feet in them. Ma says, but it's just, it's like no, no. You know, you had the trap door in them and everything else. No, nope, he wasn't going to wear them. He finally talked Grandma into cutting the feet out and hemming them. But he wore them and then itched all winter long, as we all did in those kinds of darn things. Uh, Fred's uh, son was our mailman. Or, I'm sorry, Fred was the mailman. Bill was, Bill Sweet was the father. Bill was at the, at the grocery store. Fred was the mailman. Fred used to get to our house, out to the farm, out to our place in the winter time, and he'd toot the horn two times. Dad would go out and open the barn door, and Fred would pull in and put the chains on his car because we had a hoist in the barn, and he could hook the cup, lift back into his car up and put the chains on to do the rest of his route up into Oceana County. Uh, just as uh, regular as clockwork almost. And I asked him once, I said, why don't you do that downtown before you ever start out? He says, no place to lift it. <laughs> so those were the kinds of things. Well, Roger put down here some things. Let me see. One of them is uh, what significant childhood events. Well, as I said, you know, I spent every summer as long back as I can remember. Uh, hunting and fishing and riding horses and swimming and just doing all the kinds of things that kids did at that time. When I was 14, my grandpa decided it was time for me to learn how to plow, and of course we were still, he was still using horse. And 
if any of you have ever tried to handle a single blade plow behind a Belgian horse, which takes force to get the, the shoe into the ground, and at 14 I probably weighed 90 pounds, maybe 80 pounds, I was a skinny kid, and I could not keep that damn plow in the ground. The grandpa says, you just aim for that, see that tree down here? Yeah. You just go right for that and you'll plow a beautiful straight furrow. Well, I started out, I, I plowed a furrow all right. <laughs> half of it was a furrow, half of it wasn't a furrow, half of it was on the ground, half of it was stuck into the ground, the horse couldn't even move it. But I learned how to plow. Uh, it, it took me some time to do it, but at that time there was, we didn't have a tractor. Grandpa wouldn't buy a tractor even when they were available. And uh, so, family's role in the community, well, as you all know, uh, starting with my father, he was uh, a deputy, special deputy sheriff and ran the, uh, the um, system for both fire and police in Montague and my brothers and uh, nephews and nieces and sons and everybody have been, been involved. Favorite place in the White Lake area? Um, I guess it would be back on the farm where I planted, in 1947, I planted 2,000 pine trees behind the house, behind the barn. And I guess um, my favorite place is just walking through there now and seeing little stubs that I stuck in the ground, beautiful pines that are just straight as a whip and probably could build a, <coughs> build a very nice log cabin if I wanted to. Favorite people while growing up? Well, I've already mentioned Carl and Everett. Everett was, to me, one of the most gentle, um, admirable persons uh, that I ever knew. He was the most gracious funeral director, and I worked for a number of them during my career when I was licensed. He was the most gracious funeral director that I have ever met or seen operate. I've never seen anyone else. Many people thought he was different, and he was. But his difference was, I never heard him say a mean word about a person. I never heard him swear. I, he was just a guy that uh, inspired me to be as good a person as he was. Um, his, his handling of a funeral from the, from the very embalming of the body in the embalming area was always one of graciousness and concern not only for the people who were mourning but for the person that we were working on to, uh, to prepare for the burial. Great guy. And, and uh, it irks me once in a while when I hear someone criticize him for opening a door he would always open the door. You, you couldn't get out of a car in a funeral line without ever running up there making sure that the family's door was open before they got out of the car. And that sort of thing just unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. Um, who else did I admire? Well, it all thing. Oh, I want to tell you another story about Carl. <laughs> One day I was in the store and over on the corner by the bank was a bench. And on that bench was Charlie Ruggles. Um, who else was over there? Charlie Ruggles was from the insurance. Anyway, there was three or four of the older men, about Carl's age, really, over there. And um, who was it that came in? I think it was Mr. Nelson from the store across the street came in. Carl was in the front window looking out over to the bank where those guys were sitting. And Mr. Nelson says, Carl, what are you doing? Figuring your income tax for this year? Carl says, what are you talking about? Well, you're counting those old guys sitting on that bench, aren't you? <laughs> Carl, Carl got a little upset. But since he and Mr. Nelson were pretty good friends, he kind of chuckled afterward. He says, no, he says, I just was wondering what they're talking about today. But uh, the other thing I used to 
always have to count how many bamboo fishing poles were still in the hoop outside the door on a Monday morning, because we never took them in. We had a big hoop on the side of the building, and in there was all the bamboo fishing poles. We didn't lose very many. Once in a while, there'd be a couple of them gone and no, no dollar left or whatever it was, 50 cents. Adolph Anderson was a guy that uh, I also admired. He was, uh, of course, the uh, president of the bank in Montague, along with <coughs> Joe Akabak, who was at that time, I think, president about the same time was president in Whitehall. I worked at the Parker Dairy. Remember the Parker Dairy out on Whitbeck Road? Um, I worked there. The yeah, building is still there. I worked there for two years when milking machines first came out. And uh, if you remember, the first milking machines weren't really efficient, so you had to strip the cow after you used the milking machine. And that was a job that I just did not like. <laughs> I'd rather milk a cow right from the beginning as to just work it toward the end. And we never had cows on the farm. My mother didn't like the way cows smelled. She would not have a cow on the farm. Fortunately, the Mowers, Ed Mowers and his mother, who lived on the northwest corner of uh, Hancock, just across the road from us, he had two Jersey cows, beautiful little Jerseys and he gave great milk, lots of cream. Ed was handicapped um, from an unfortunate accident. His father whipped him with a buggy whip once as a boy when he did something. He went upstairs and went to bed, and when he came down the next morning, he was paralyzed on the left side. And uh, Ed never married, of course, and walked with a very bad limp. But he and his mother were there. So we would get the milk from them, and we had lots of chickens, and so they would get the chickens and the eggs from us. It never cost us a nickel, it was just a back and forth. You know, you get, you get the chicken and eggs, and we get the milk and cream. So that's the way it went at those times. Um, outstanding events in Montague? Well, like in Whitehall, the homecoming was always a big event. I mean, that, it was a big event to close the street down, just like we do now. Uh, Friday movies, um, what else? What about the Franklin House fire? The Franklin House fire was a big fire. And, uh, I was down there all by myself uh, when it first started because I was <clears throat> on duty that night. And I don't remember who turned the alarm in, but I knew that it was going to go down. Uh, there was no question in my mind that it was a honor. And if you see one of the pictures that was taken, you'll see me standing all by myself. There's only one fire truck there at the time, standing in the middle of Ferry and Dowling Street, looking at the hotel as it's burning up. That was a, a bad, bad situation.